Hello everyone, my name is Sean Galloway and I'm with ProLife Safety. I thank you for your interest in this webinar, Lean Behavior-Based Safety, a 30-minute overview. For the webinar today, this is what I'd like to cover. I'd like to discuss what Lean Behavior-Based Safety is, how it fits into operational and safety excellence, the approach itself, and it's customizable for every type of organization, and it should be even within a single company. What works for one site not necessarily will work for another site. You have to make the process fit the organization rather than trying to make the organization fit the process. So I do want to share with you what the methodology typically looks like. And you want to stay true to the principles, but again, you want to make the approach fit the organization. So how do you do that? I'll discuss some of the most common implementation approaches and the steps that people take. And I'll start to conclude in this short webinar and, and video that you'll be watching what it takes to make it work and what we found working with hundreds and hundreds of existing processes, what typically leads to failures. And I'll conclude with uh, an opportunity for you to gather more information. Now, our company has been very, very fortunate to work with some great organizations. This is just a small sampling of the many companies we've worked with since 1993. Our company typically focuses on working with many of the best already safety performing companies throughout the world. Now, some organizations are on a journey to safety excellence that it's still going to take them many years. Some of them are a little bit closer than others. But we're trying to, we're trying to get to this point with behavioral approaches to better understand what safety really is rather than what it isn't. We want to move past just the limited zero incident thinking and we want to look at it and say what is safety excellence? Because if we define safety excellence as the lack of our incidents, and this is part of what BBS tries to help fill the, the void that's there, because if safety means not getting hurt, well, then anything that I do that doesn't get me hurt must be safe. And that's certainly not the case. So with this approach, we worked with many, many great organizations throughout the world to help redefine what safety excellence really looks like. Because if safe is defined by just not having any accidents, and if excellence is defined by, by zero recordables as well, well, what happens when we get there? Because if we hit zero recordables and we can't precisely describe why we're there, how do we have any sense of comfort and validity that we're going to achieve it the following year? Or is it that we just got a little bit luckier this year? So behavioral approaches, and specifically the lean approach to this we're going to talk, talk about today, this has been around since the 1970s and the 1980s. Now behavioral approaches to safety in general, well, behaviors have always played a role in safety. I'll talk about that today as well. Now, how you focus this tool of behavior-based safety, where and what you focus it on, is what really makes or breaks the approach. So what is lean behavior-based safety? Well, the first thing that it provides is it provides a focus. We want to identify the key things that go above and beyond the rules, policies, and procedures, the things that are often blind spots in organizational focus to really help prevent future incidents, accidents, and injuries. If you go to a group of individuals and you ask them, and I would encourage you to consider doing this, ask them, what's the most likely thing to get you injured here? Here's my prediction. If you ask 50 people, you're going to get on average about 20 different answers. We've performed well over 1,000 organizational safety culture assessments, and this is a question I've used quite regularly. We've also implemented well over 2,000 customized lean, be lean behavior-based safety processes in 30 to 40 different countries around the world at the time of this recording. So what it starts to provide is a better focus. There's a lot of things that organizations are focusing on in safety, but are they focusing on the most important thing? I love what the late management guru, Peter Drucker, once said, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. And a lot of times we're spending a lot of great energy in safety, but are we focusing on what's really going to transform both our performance and the culture that will help us sustain the performance? So it helps provide a focus. It also adds something that's often missing, unfortunately, in safety approaches, and that's positive reinforcement. That's the R plus you'll see there. So after we have a focus, we want to go out and influence people. 
If you think about it, if you go out and just provide edicts, telling somebody what to do from a level of authority, you might move some hands and some feet, but are you really going to tap into the hearts and minds that are critical to get to that level of excellence? You will never get to excellence because excellence is sustained success. You'll never get to excellence if you only focus on controlling behavior and controlling people. We need to look at how can we inspire, how can we influence that discretionary effort that's critical for improving and progressing our performance here. So we want to influence. We best want to understand why somebody might take a risk. Here's something a lot of people forget. The majority of time when, when an injury or incident occurred, people meant to be doing what they were doing. It just didn't mean for it to turn out that way. People aren't purposely going out and saying, how can I get injured today? At least most individuals aren't doing that. People do things for a reason. I love what Doug Larson once said, wisdom is the result of a lifetime of listening when you would have preferred to have talked. So are we going out and listening? Like in lean thinking, if you're familiar with lean and, and lean methodologies, GIMBA, going out into the workplace and involving people in the problem solving that are currently performing the tasks, we want to gather a better understanding of well, if people are doing a task a certain way, why are they doing it that way? Is there something that makes it difficult or impossible? Is it just the way we've always done it? Is it because we've created that mindset because we've told the organization safety means not getting hurt, so whatever you do as long or whatever you do as long as you don't get injured must be okay. That's why I've published several things on zero based goals sometimes encourage risk taking because we just focus the organization on working hard to not fail rather than focusing on what excellence looks like and how can we achieve more of it. So we want to listen and say, if people can do certain things to help prevent injuries, if we know there are mechanisms and, and approaches we can take to control risk exposure, why can't people or why aren't people able to take these precautions or, or do it a certain way? And then we want to measure a little bit differently. One of the reasons organizations will fail to achieve excellence in their safety performance and their safety culture one of the common reasons is because they spend the majority of their time focusing on measuring what they don't want rather than measuring what they do want in safety. So what do we want in safety? Of course we don't want zero injuries, so we want people to not get hurt. Well, what do we want them to do that controls that risk exposure at all levels of the organization for that matter? So this has, spells out an, an easy acronym to remember in our methodology. We just call it FILM, Focus, Influence, Listen, and Measure. Now, where this fits into the overall approach around safety excellence, and keep in mind, what you'll hear me talk about very shortly is BBS, behavior-based safety, is a situationally appropriate tool to address one of the four types of behaviors in safety. So this is where it fits in a model that we call the bridge to safety excellence. If you think about where you currently are and where you're trying to go, that level of sustainable excellence, able to repeat success to where it's statistically significant, one of the first things we do in safety, the first pillar of support we put in place is management. These are the things we have to do, the regulation, the policies, the procedures that we put in place. We have to make sure that we're perfecting and we're getting great at the compliance before you start looking at advanced mechanisms. But that only gets you partially across. You have to have rules, and you have to enforce those rules. Now, a question that I've asked, and our folks in ProX Safety have asked in culture assessments around the world, can you obey all the rules? Can you follow all the procedures? Can you wear all their personal protective equipment and still get injured? Of course you can. Those things are critical. They're important. They are our foundation, but it's not a complete picture. You have to, at some point, once you've done a great job here, and you can't start focusing on discretionary behaviors and safety until you start ensuring that you're perfecting the work environment to the best of your ability, and you are creating compliance around the things that we know will protect ourselves from the high probability and high severity incidents that might occur out there. Once you've done a great job here focusing on the basics, what we call traditional safety, that's when you can start involving the workforce here. In what you want help with is the culture, the way we do things around here, why we do what we do. Now, where this can help with from the behavioral perspective is it helps to identify the focus. To us in ProX Safety, focus is an acronym for forming one common understanding of safety. 
What's one thing if you could focus all of your employees on above and beyond the things that's management and supervisor's responsibility? What's one thing if you could focus them on could have the biggest impact on 20, 30, 40 percentage, percent of your injuries? What one thing? If you don't know that answer, well, here's an opportunity for you. You have to develop a focus above and beyond the rules, policies, and procedures, which falls into the management's responsibility, and you have to develop a mechanism to help reinforce that. We all know what people do when nobody's looking is an element of everybody's culture. If you think about it for your own perspective, what you do when nobody's looking is a reflection of your personal values and beliefs. So what a group of people do when no one's looking is an overall reflection of the group norms and, and thinking and, and behaviors and everything. Now, once we start to develop that, we need some other things to stabilize this. We need leadership. A lot of companies say safety is a condition of employment. Now, all employment is a behavioral rental agreement, so I understand that. But what we're talking about are the mandatory behaviors, the things according to government regulation in many parts of the world that if you don't do, you could lose your job. The government authorities could come in and shut you down if you don't do these things. So we want to manage our results to some degree. We want to manage compliance. But are we influencing people to do more than what's necessary? Are we influencing people to go above and beyond? That's leadership. We also need to be establishing and continuously building the trust between the levels of the organization. Trust is the glue that keeps your organization together. Trust also is the, is the mechanism that helps facilitate discretionary effort. Think about yourself. Have you ever worked for somebody that you just really didn't trust? How much discretionary effort did you provide to help that individual be successful? And we have to establish a strong sense of teamwork. A lot of companies think they have teams. Uh, they may end up having committees and not teams, but we want to establish a strong sense of teamwork. I worked with somebody years ago that had a nice little saying, and it was, teamwork means we're not going to allow each other to fail regardless who we are. I thought that was a nice, simple description. Whether you're the, the chief executive or you're a brand new contractor, temporary employee, we're all in this together. Now, in safety, we're always going to be measuring our failure rates. Your incidents, your recordable rates, so all of that, they don't tell you how to get better, especially once you get to a part where you're pretty good in safety. It's your failure rate, though. Nobody designs their safety management systems or compliance systems, everything, to expect to have injuries. When they do, it's a failure in our system to protect somebody from getting injured. And we can't wait for somebody to get injured to figure out where the hole in our system is or the chink in our armor. This is why we have to start going out and saying, well, what's the performance that's necessary to help us accomplish our results? You can't just focus on the results, because any time you reward a great result, by default, you're reinforcing the performance that got it. Was it lucky performance or purposeful intent? So we want to influence this focused performance and help ensure we have ways that it can be reinforced when no one's looking. Now, I wanted to share this with you to put it into perspective, because people tend to focus focus behavioral processes and in the wrong area sometimes. Now there are two categories for the four types of safety behaviors. The first one is injury incident, accident prevention behaviors. There are certain things that people have to do, some of it are mandatory, some of it discretionary, like wearing PPE, like locking out and tagging out. There are certain things people have to do to contribute to preventing the injuries. So there are mandatory things. And the way we go about doing that is we have to have control mechanisms. We have to ensure people are doing what's required to remain employed, like, again, the aforementioned lockout tagout. Now, there are other things that people have to do that are at their discretion. People could do it and still keep their job or not do it and still keep their job. Like a very common one is keeping yourself out of the path of moving energy, line of fire. Don't put any part of your body where your eyes haven't previously scanned, eyes on path. Maintain three points of contact. You know, there are things that most organizations don't have rules about because they would be very difficult to enforce and control. This approach here is you want to influence it. Now, just for your benefit and, and not really the topic of this discussion, though, there are other types of behaviors in safety. There are behaviors that contribute to the desirable safety culture. Now, there are mandatory things. There are things that you have to do while being an employee. Some organizations have it like you have to attend safety meetings or you have to 
you have to take certain tests and you participate in certain training that if you don't do, you, your performance and your job could be in jeopardy. But there are also discretionary things. Now, if you look at the different types of things, things that are mandatory, you have to have systems to control that. Now, that's not what BBS was designed for. BBS was designed to influence people to go above and beyond. It's designed to give people ideas that they can internalize and take it with them everywhere they go. We don't want to just help people be safe at work. We want people to be safe where there's actually more risk. In many of the developed countries around the world, you are actually much more likely to get injured away from work than at work. And from a management business perspective, if somebody goes home and gets injured, they're going to be just as absent as if they got injured on the job. You're still going to experience a good portion of your indirect costs because somebody got injured regardless where they were. But this tool, BBS, it's a situationally appropriate tool to address one of the four types of safety behaviors. Now, once an organization decides they want to implement the approach, there's, there's a couple of different things to consider. First off, you have to assess. And we teach people how to, or we participate in the assessment process to make sure that the sites are ready for this, to make sure you have the desired level of support. Most importantly, if you have the existing systems and traditional safety in, in place. But once you assess and you strategically plan what we're going to call behavior-based safety, how we're going to do it, who we're going to involve, who's going to do the observations, where we're going to focus it, what time of the day, what are the resources, all of that, you may move forward and say, you know what, we don't see a lot of challenges. We can move forward and customize and do all the training and all the, all the development for the process. Sometimes you might have a bad experiences with existing volunteer-led processes. You may have had more voluntold processes than volunteered. So you may need to do a little uh, backup and, and build in some knowledge so people know what they're going to be volunteering for. In some situations, the sites and the organizations are just not ready. You shouldn't push forward with saying, yes, we're absolutely going to implement, because some sites might not be ready. And in, in any change methodology, a false start almost always creates barriers to future attempts. So it's important to look at those things that might be the red flags. We have some workshops we'll talk about in a little bit that help go over and help you better understand what those red flags are. But it's best to understand if this situational tool fits right now. And I know it's a cliche and, and a joke, but there is a difference in doing it right versus right now. So what does this approach look like? Well, it's centered around the work that people do. The organization, the, the, the processes that are, that are out there that work very, very well have some sort of team of people. Now, who's on that team? Who's on that committee? Well, it's going to be a little bit different organization by organization, depending on two primary things the culture and trust levels in the, within the culture. Now, there's a lot of things to consider here, but I'm not trying to simplify this, but it's a brief webinar, keep in mind. You need to have some sort of group of individuals that can manage this process. They need to know how to put it together, because they're going to be dependent on to keep this process focused on results, not just on cranking the process. They need to know how to develop the checklist. It needs to be their observation strategy. The late Dr. W. Edwards Deming said it best. People support what they help to create. If I give the organization their plan, their observation strategy and checklist, who does that really belong to, me or the organization? It's the same if you have somebody internally leading this. Their goal at some point should be to separate, to create sustainability within the team that's not leaded by constant prompting from within or, or external. But the team needs to look at the previous incident data. They need to perform a Pareto analysis, which is a different type of Pareto, where we typically look at the type of incidents, the body part, classification, all that. You look at these to determine preventability, not look at causation. Because never forget, behaviors cannot be the root cause of an accident. People do things for a reason. That's a deeper issue than the behavior. Sometimes we stop at the behavior because we can't answer the next question, well, why did they do it? So you want to develop this checklist. Now, here's I'm going to show you two samples. This is what one checklist looks like for an organization, and I just helped them implement with their own trained internal resources. I just went and participated in a couple of steps at the request. But this is what their checklist looks like. There's a place to gather information to capture an understanding about what the concern was, uh, why it was taking place. No names are ever collected. In this particular process, 
the there's only employees that are involved based on trust levels. There's only employees. The data only goes back to the employees. They only focus on voluntary things. And there's a strong leadership commitment, and we have put in put very specific things in place to make sure discipline's never associated with this, and that and that leadership is not getting all the raw data here and all the all the individual detail. They're just going to look at the summary and the key process indicators. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people say that there are a handful of behaviors or precautions that always apply. Well, in the same organization at a different location, here's their checklist. Completely different items that they had identified in the very beginning. By the way, those percentages equal what percentage of the incidents could these have prevented if we're doing the same type of work tomorrow and into the future. You'll see that sometimes it'll equal more than 100%, but this is the significant few. And often, more than one precaution could have prevented a single event. So we look at this, and by the way, who could have prevented it isn't just the injured party. Sometimes it's what a supervisor was doing nearby that could have prevented it, or a manager, or another employee nearby. You'll notice that they added one of the items, to the only one that was on the previous one, and that's alignment, because this is now a mature process. They've had it in place for a while, and they've added it to the checklist because based on what they're also seeing while they're doing observations, they identified some alignment concerns, which is lifting practices, and they put it on their checklist. But this is a key thing. The team made this decision. They own the process. They are tweaking it because they have seen proactively some concerns before it turned into incidents and they had to react, and they modified their checklist. So this is just an example that there are so many different ways that you can go about doing this, but you want to make it fit the organization. So after you develop the checklist, you have to develop some sort of observation strategy. Now what we're trying to discover here is can people take these precautions? If they can, great, let's encourage them. Let's point out what they're doing that's safe. If they're not, let's gather an understanding of why. There's a lot of information on our website at proactsafety.com, including an article that's titled Influencers on Risk, and it goes into these four primary things that we like to separate them into because that's how you develop action plans. Is it people don't perceive the risk? Is it they're just in the habit of doing it a different way? Is there something that makes it difficult or impossible? So you want to gather this information. This tends to go into a, a database. There's a lot of commercial software available. Some organizations, we help them build it themselves. But this has to go back to the team and maintain that transformational thinking. What one thing, if we could focus on, could help us be excellent in safety? What one thing, if we could focus on, could remove the biggest barrier to safe performance? Now, how we do the observations, what we focus it on, well, it depends on the organization's existing data or known exposure to risk. In a lot of companies, there are certain times of the day, day of the week. There are certain scheduled activities that we know increase risk exposure. There are so many different methodologies. The most common one is everybody has to do an observation. There is some benefit to that, but there are a significant amount of negative side effects that can occur with that that we unfortunately don't have time for in this webinar. But there are multiple different approaches here. Ideally, the goal is to get to the point to where anyone can have a conversation about safety that's pointing out the positive things or expressing concern. But we have to, again, look at trust levels. Who's best to do this? How can we have the biggest impact and continuously evolve our process? What's critical as well is there has to be defined roles, responsibilities, and results at all levels of the organization where the process is existing. What's the supervisor's responsibility? What does support look like? What doesn't it look like? What about the, what about the workers themselves, the observers or safety coaches? the individuals on the steering committee. We've developed all of these. We provide them as templates to the organizations we work with. They can use a large percentage of it, but again, we want that sense of ownership, so we encourage that they're used as templates. You have to have a data plan to this. Once we're developing the process and you look at the operational flow of it, how do we develop and prioritize action plans? What action plans help us improve the process? Which ones help us improve safety? The ultimate goal is to improve safety through this, not to crank and crank our observations and hit some sort of numbers requirement, that's, the, that's not the goal. But of course, if we don't do any observations, it's hard for the process to have an impact. But there are several different ways that you have to manage this process, and there needs to be a very sound data plan to this. You also have to have your leading indicators. 
Are we hitting our target number of observations? Unfortunately, it becomes the number one and the only indicator that a lot of companies look at. We've developed a methodology that looks at five key indicators. Two of them are process related. The other three are results. Are we working our plan for the critical things? And is our plan having the desired impact in the three primary areas? And some of them you'd be surprised by. But that gives the organization a single leading indicator that's more of a comprehensive look at the major areas of your effectiveness and efficiency in your process. Now, obviously, at the site level, you want to be able to dive into this information. But even the site leader, typically, they want to see that one indicator. If they have a little bit more involvement, they may want to see additional information as well. But the most common approaches to implementing these processes, we have a public workshop that we hold several times a year. And we limit the amount of individuals that can attend that. But that's for if there are many different companies that are in there. We want to ensure that we can really get the value out of that and that they can get what's necessary to go back and be successful. We also do the same type of workshop privately for individuals. We want to make sure that they have a private implementation of, uh, available at their site. So we can either do a public workshop or we can do it privately at their site, uh, get, getting individuals from different areas of the organization. And it's the same, essentially it's the same information that we go over in the public approach, but what's a little bit different is we help the organization develop their own implementation guidelines. We, we also, when we do the private implementation workshop, that's a little bit different than the internal consultant one. That's if we take a site and we get a handful of people together and we help them develop their own process, but they are going to be responsible for launching it and all the implementation that's necessary. Some organizations want us to fully support and lead all the activities. We tend to encourage organizations to look for ways that they can do a lot of this themselves. If you are just looking for a consultant to lead everything, personally, I'm a little concerned about that because if organizations don't identify the resources necessary for, for sustainability in the beginning, rarely do they in the end. So we're encouraging more and more people to look at not having, your, not having a, an external consultant be the first approach that's there. Obviously, we can do that. We've implemented, as I've said, about 2,000 processes around the world. But if the goal is sustainability and internalization of everything, how can we internalize this as quickly as possible and as practical as possible? So some organizations will train some key internal individuals, and then we'll support them on an as-needed or where it adds value approach. Now, what it takes to make this process successful, you have to ensure that you have readiness and you've addressed that. You have to have a customized process. It has to fit the organization. And it needs the ability to keep evolving over time because anything that provides value today eventually is going to become an awkward fit to the organization if it isn't tweaked over time. So the group, the organization needs the ability to customize the materials. So they need materials provided in a way that can be modified. And the same with the approach as well. If you have to go back and ask permission from somebody, who really owns the process? You need leadership support, and that's at all levels, and that's both labor union and the salaried leaders as well. We work with most of the major unions around the world, and it's critical that they're involved from the very beginning on this. You have to have cooperation from the supervisor. You have to have leadership in the process. You have to have both a, some sort of steering committee. You have to have somebody, if it's just employees involved, if that's the approach you've taken, you need to ensure that you have some sort of facilitator or sponsor from leadership. You have to have observers. What's the minimal number? Well, at least one. What's the maximum number? Everybody in the organization. What's the most effective way that's going to work for your organization? Well, that's going to be different site by site. You have to have support and overall strategy, as I've outlined for you. And you have to have a succession plan. What happens if you lose the great support, if you lose people in your process? There's a lot of things that, that need to be considered when you're evolving and developing your approach. And you have to have a true positive and proactive accountability plan. Who's going to do what? And how are we going to ensure that they're doing it before we're looking at our results to see that it make a difference or not? Now, the top 10 things that typically lead to failures is when we force the process in. When people aren't ready, they don't want to be involved, but we force their involvement and it becomes mandatory. A gotcha approach, if we use this to go out and catch people doing things wrong, or we use that information to discipline them. These are things that are essentially BBS 101 no-nos. You should never do these things. 
when processes just focus on the observations, but they don't develop focused action plans, or they don't make the successes extremely visible to people. If people don't see a lot of successes, who's going to want to be involved in this? If retention and internalization is thought about after we've implemented the process, you don't want too much dependency on an external, on an external advisor for this. If we just stop at the behavior without understanding that people do things for a reason and address the reasons, not the behavior. If we fall too much in love with the methodology, any methodology, again, that produces some results needs to be continuously advanced and evolved. And you, as a site, as an organization, need the capability of making those changes. If you have to call in the consulting mechanic, it's like buying a car with the hood welded shut. You need the capability of tweaking the methodology and realizing that what got you some results isn't necessarily what's going to keep you evolving. You can't expect miracles. This is a tool that addresses one area of safety and hopefully helps you strengthen your other, your other tools in your safety toolbox. But this cannot be the overall strategy. This has to fit within a comprehensive approach to achieving excellence and safety. So, we always look at ways that we can integrate this without having, having to reinvent wheels. Some organizations, this is focused on behavior-based quality. Some organizations, this becomes a fundamental part of their Lean Six Sigma approaches. But there's a lot of things that we can, we can focus on so we don't create unnecessary resistance to change. And we manage that by often minimizing the perception of it. The checklist sizes, we encourage a small, very focused rather than very specific 15, 20 behaviors which will never become internalized in an organization, always relying on the observation checklists. You have to have these support roles as we talked about. The training needs to be just enough, just in time. We don't need to overtrain people. What's going to add value today and what can we start to evolve as we progress in this process? The observation strategies, as you've heard me talk about, there are so many different approaches. But we have to look at it and say, what's the, what's the waste in our process? What are the things that we can eliminate that don't add any value? The steering team sizes. You want this to be a team that can always get together, but also a team that's representative of the work that people do. A team of 15, 20 people rarely get together on a constant basis to manage this process. You have to utilize the data, and most importantly, you have to keep your efficiency goggles on while you're looking to be effective here. So there are a lot of things to consider when you start to implement a lean behavior-based safety approach. But most importantly, it looks at how can we add value the quickest possible, how can we build those successes and move on, rather than just this being this enormous resource that typically adds some results but tends to take a long time to get up and running by, by how much it takes for this process to be successful. You don't want to do that because, again, that will tend to delay the results. And if you don't get quick return on investment, people will look at this in the, as another potential program of the month. There's a lot of information that's on our website. We've published many articles, podcasts, videos on this. Please feel free to visit our website for more information or contact me and ask for me. My name is Sean Galloway. I'd be more than happy to speak with you personally about the different approaches and the options that are out there. I wish you great success in your journey, and I hope this webinar gives you a different perspective into behavior-based safety and how it might work for your organization. Have a great and safe day.